just as everybody's arriving in and uh, um, settling down, just to let you know that um, this is the Economy and Society virtual summer school or virtual lecture series for 2020, unfortunately forced online. And we're delighted today to welcome uh, Professor Elizabeth Anderson, Professor of Philosophy and Women and Gender Studies at the University of Michigan. Um, and she's a, the John Dewey Professor, which is, you know, an, an August title indeed, as well as the recipient of, of the MacArthur Genius Prize. So we are absolutely delighted to have uh, her with us today. And just before I uh, just, just uh, uh, begin to ask her about her work, just to let you know the seminar is being recorded. Uh, the recordings will be available. Uh, I think all mics are muted until we get to around, you know, halfway through the session, and then and then you'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll invite uh, questions from the floor. Uh, but I suppose um, here we go, basically, and delighted to have you with us, uh, um, Elizabeth. And um, you have this uh, fascinating title, "The Great Reversal: How Neoliberalism Turned the Work Ethic Against Workers." It's a, it's, a his, it's a historical piece, it's a philosophical piece, it's an economic and social science piece. Tell me about it, what, what, what's, what's the big thesis in, in, in all of this? For somebody, for, for those who are coming relatively newly to your work even, uh, what, what's, what, tell me about your new book. Yes, so it's a history of the Protestant work ethic from the 17th century to the present, in which I'm arguing that contemporary neoliberalism is really just a rewarmed version of the harsh anti-worker conservative work ethic that Max Weber described in his classic about the Protestant work ethic. But what I'm aiming to do in my book is to recover another side of the work ethic that I think Max Weber missed, which is what I call the progressive or pro-worker work ethic and I argue that if you go back to the original Puritan texts in which the work ethic was elaborated, you could see that it's filled with contradictions. And that on the one hand, the Puritans saw work as a form of ascetic discipline, self-denial, a way, you know, if your nose is to the grindstone, then your mind will not wander off into temptation and sin. But then there's this other side which is that, well, what is work after all? It is the performance of God's will for human beings on earth. And what God wills us to do is to promote the welfare of our fellow human beings. Every last one of them without exception, <laughs> okay? And so work becomes exalted because you're really doing God's work. And that means every laborer needs to be respected. And, and so I follow in my book, the history of that pro-worker view through the history of political economy and argue that Locke, Adam Smith, the Ricardian socialists, John Stuart Mill, even Marx <laughs> were actually developing that progressive work ethic until it culminated in social democracy in Europe. What I find great about that is it's not just one work ethic, it's multiple work ethics, but also it's not, the, it's not necessarily the big bad work ethic of capitalism, but it's, it, it's, it's almost a, a positive moral or cultural force uh, in, in this way, because it, it's, it's embracing and, uh, as you say, raising up work and, and, and the activities of every person so, I mean, that's, that's it's really great to have a, a positive steer on the work ethic for a change. Yes, and, and, but the other thing, too, that I'm going to stress <clears throat> in this book is that not everything that people do to make money counts as work. Hmm. So you go back to Richard Baxter and, and Sanderson, the two Puritans who I think are key figures in formulating the original work ethic, they saw there was all kinds of money-making schemes, various business models, which made lots of money, but in their view did not count as work because the only thing that counts as work is activity that helps our fellow human beings. Whereas neoliberalism today is a form of shareholder capitalism. The idea is just to maximize profits by whatever means necessary. 
And whether that ends up ruining other people's lives doesn't matter as long as you can make money off of it. And so, for instance, payday lenders in the United States, you're desperate for cash, you got to pay your landlord, but your paycheck isn't coming for another week. So you go to a payday lender who charges 300% annual interest rates so that you can pay your landlord to avoid eviction, okay, or pay your water utility bill to avoid having water cut off. And, and then you become a debt peon, right? Because all the profits come from the fact that you have to constantly roll over that loan, right? Because you can never pay it off with the interest mounting, okay? And, and the Puritans saw that kind of exploitative usury. That's not work. That's just exploitation. They actually had a pretty sound business ethics and condemned a lot of the stuff that modern capitalist firms do today to make money and maximize their profits. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, can you, can you tell us more about how this progressive work ethic was transmuted or, uh, ad, I don't know, transformed into the conservative work ethic? How did this, how did this bifurcation uh, happen? How, how, how did they- Yeah, I think the critical out? moment, so, if you go back to the 17th century, the model worker for the Puritans was, was a yeoman farmer or a master craftsman. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about these two model workers is that they're simultaneously manual workers, but they also own property. They're working their own capital. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so in that context, it makes sense to combine the duties, which will have a kind of ascetic element to them and the rights and privileges and honors, right? The benefits, <laughs> right? Because if you're simultaneously a capitalist and a manual worker, you're experiencing both sides of that and it's kind of a unified thing. <clears throat> what the industrial revolution did was split off the capital owners from the manual laborers into two entirely different classes of people, mm. okay? And so that afforded an opportunity as the work ethic got secularized, right? To have two class versions of the work ethic, one for the capitalists, right? And one for the workers. And that's essentially what happened. The, the progressive pro-worker work ethic is developing the positive implications of the work ethic for workers. Like we're the ones who are doing the real work here. And then the property owners developed their own version of the work ethic, which I call the conservative work ethic. And deeply ironically, you know, in the 17th century, it wasn't just beggars in the streets who were condemned. In fact, they were second in line after the idle landlords, who were the real biggest targets, drones in the nest, right? Uh, <clears throat> And the landlords, though, wanted to justify their position within the work ethic, and they create this very reactionary version of the work ethic, according to which the landlords, with all their leisure time, were actually the founts of civilization mm. and were entitled to basically put the lower orders, the peasants to work in order to extract a surplus that was needed to support civilization. Mm -hmm. So you see that picture in Waitley. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and it, it was the foundational theory of imperialism, which yeah. was, you know, inherent in the British Empire, including in Ireland, as you I'm sure are vividly aware. <laughs> yeah, I was just struck actually, but, but, but I mean, and I, I, I kind of encountered it before in your work on you know, when the markets were left, but this position of the, the, the worker, owner, occupier, capitalist and labor combined in sort of the form of the petty bourgeois landowner or something like that, or the, or the small holder, or the small landowner. And it just strikes me, just as you're saying, isn't that, I don't know, isn't that a recipe for good ecological stewardship? of a place because if you if you are invested in this one place and your capital is not mobile but uh, you 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 own specific concrete things 
it's interesting because this imperialist exploitation and this, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, do you see, do you see that they're- Oh, I agree entirely. To, I actually have a graduate student who's working on that very idea. Yeah. So she <clears throat> is developing a Lockean theory of property um, for um, environmental justice, basically. Mm. Yeah, and de definitely defending the smallholder who's a much better steward of the land than these giant mega corporations that are taking over agriculture in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is fascinating. Um, I sort of feel I might have interrupted you too early then, just when you're getting going. But um, can I ask you about um, in, in in your work? Outsourcing has a particularly strong importance. And I was just struck by this as, as we look at the, the vaccines being spread across the world. And I thought, Jesus, why are we why is so much of that outsourced? How crazy? What a strange way to, you know, the next thing, next time there's a world war, will we be outsourcing the tanks? You know, probably something like that, you know. Um, why is it why is it do you think that this 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 conservative work ethic uh, connects into the capitalist uh, practice of outsourcing so strongly? Yeah, well, that really goes back to Bentham. <clears throat> and again, you know, if you look at the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, I argue that they're basically, it's a, it's a, you have a kind of competition, maybe even an esteemed competition between the, the government workers who are basically all coming from the aristocracy and the industrialists who are very disproportionately dissenters. Mm -hmm. And the dissenters went into business, into capitalism, because they were shut out of government office mm -hmm. uh, under the test acts. They, they couldn't serve. Mm -hmm. And so they just despised the fact that basically, you know, the second and third sons of the lazy landlords were placing you know, getting placed in these no-show jobs, right? Because nobody expected them actually to serve the public. I mean, ostensibly that's what they're doing, but really they're taking bribes and collecting salaries and stuff. They're really lazy, <laughs> just like their dads. <laughs> and right, and these, these dissenters, they're, they're descended from the Puritans essentially, and they just despise these people. Right, and it wasn't crazy in their day to think that government workers were really lazy. They were, <laughs> look where they're coming from. There wasn't really a serious concept of civil service and they didn't have a professionalized civil service back then. In fact, the civil service in Britain, it was an innovation of the East India Company around the time that John Stuart Mill was an officer. In the East, but that's like already a couple decades after Bentham. Sure. So <clears throat> it wasn't crazy for Bentham to think if you have an important function to be served, public function to be served, it's probably not a good idea to assign that function to the lazy government workers. Hmm. Get this industrial, right, industrious businessman to do it, and it'll be much more efficient. And, and that's really the, where outsourcing comes, the fundamental argument for outsourcing. And indeed, neoliberalism is really just unknowingly dredging up Bentham's original arguments, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And putting them in fancy, you know, public choice language, but it's really the same idea. However, mm -hmm. what I argue is that it actually is kind of, it isn't taking account of the fact that societies have developed since Bentham in two very important ways. One way is the government's actually acquired a professional civil service. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and a lot of them are actually highly competent people mm -hmm. who really care about doing a good job. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if, 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 if any of you uh, happened to view on uh, uh, the landing of the Mars rover Perseverance on Mars. If you saw that, I mean, I tuned in because my dad, I grew up, you know, my dad was an aeronautical engineer. So, right, we watched all the moon landings back in the day <laughs> with great excitement. And 
what I loved about this was that these are all government workers, by the way. They're part of NASA's big government agent. These people are very high tech people. Mm. And they land this rover, which is just an astonishing piece of engineering. And it is true that they worked with the private sector on a lot of things, but still the mission itself was under the control of, of government workers. And after it landed, there was a little speech that was given by uh, basically the, the head guy who was managing the whole landing. And he said, government is back. We can do things, <laughs> all right, we can succeed. And it just like to up, uproarious applause by all the workers. Because as I'm sure you know, one of Trump's missions, which he performed quite successfully, was a systematic war against the government agencies. Mm -hmm. And he just took a wrecking ball to one after another, perhaps most notoriously to the State Department, which was is now laid waste. <laughs> but in fact, most of the agencies have been wrecked and corrupted mm -hmm. because the leadership that, that Trump appointed was themselves either corrupt and self-dealing or utterly incompetent and had no idea what the agencies were doing and didn't care about their missions, or they were actively hostile to their missions, like the people he, he appointed to run the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, mm -hmm. okay? Right, so they're all demoralized and finally, right? <laughs> Here's a great success. And, Really, I bet the whole civil service was watching, not just NASA, hmm. and, and, and seeing that finally their work was being appreciated. Yeah. Why? Because these are professionals. <laughs> hmm. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting, um, that critique of states that you get in, kind of liberalism and all that. But go, kind of going back to Bentham, what really strikes me is, when I was, when I was reading your work, um, you, that this word associated with Bentham utilitarianism, it's sometimes yeah, yeah. used in such a narrow way, especially, especially, I mean, I don't know, something maybe it's about the narrowness of my own academic orbit, but utilitarian is almost a curse word or something. It's associated with Bentham's, ta you know, tables of pleasures and pains and this individual self-seeking. But uh, your, your point historically is that utilitarian is the utility of the greater good, as in, yeah. as in John Stuart Mill or something like that. So you have a movement from... The, the individual good, the greater good, or sorry, the other way around, um, and uh, which which is really striking, um, and is, is that is that um, I mean, is, is that a key kind? Oh, of... it's absolutely key, and it's coming straight out of the Puritans. So I didn't send this section, mm -hmm. but I describe how the Puritans invented utilitarianism, which itself is just one of these delicious ironies in the history of of moral and political thought. Hmm. You would never expect this because utilitarianism today is this ultra, ultra secular doctrine. Hmm. <laughs> it really is coming straight out of the Puritans. Anyway, but here's the important thing. Within, within moral philosophy, the biggest knock against utilitarianism is that if you're only going to be maximizing total utility, you can hmm. just go along and like sacrifice individuals along the way for the greater good. Hmm. And that's why my, my dissertation advisor, John Rawls, right, his big project was showing, no, we have justice, right? Mm -hmm. Distributive justice is important, independently important. And, you know, that, that matters that even the least advantaged need to be benefited by the rules of the system. And you shouldn't just caring about, you know, maximizing GDP, you want to make sure that even the, the least advantaged in society are benefited by the inequalities that exist there. Mm. And in fact, that was exactly what the Puritans meant by utilitarianism. Every particular person, including the lowest worker, mm. needs to be treated with respect have a living wage, get decent working conditions, not be abusively ruled over by their employers. <laughs> it's all there in the original Puritan text. You have to bring everyone along, no one left behind. Yeah. And so 
all their prescriptions about maximizing profits were under these constraints of distributive justice. But as utilitarianism got secularized and turned into the conservative work ethic, they tossed out any obligations to uplift mm. the least among us, <laughs> right? Right. And, and no. right. So you could just exploit them just in order to maximize profits. And that's also what shareholder capitalism is about. Yeah. Right. You just run roughshod over the people who are too disadvantaged to effectively defend themselves. And, and about, just, you know, it's fascinating. I mean, like this, 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 I mean, this is, um, this is really interesting because it's, it's, we're, we're covering some terrain, which is in a way sort of familiar and yet from a really different angle whereby we're finding most of the ideals and the economic notions uh, underpinning them actually have religious roots. And oh, yet, totally, yes. <laughs> but it, yes. not all of them, right? Or, or th those things that are, are, are there also religious roots to be found beneath the conservative work ethic or, or, or the... Well, there are, right? Because it comes from this idea of work as ascetic discipline, yeah. which is also there in the Puritans. But okay. it's only discipline for these lowly workers, right? Not for the capitalists. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, Elon Musk could be tweeting and having fun with his work. <laughs> yeah. or, or as they say, Jeff Bezos, the first Amazon worker ever to get a break, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll tell you something about Amazon because my brother-in-law uh, actually is an executive at Amazon. And we were going to have this big family reunion. And my son just adores his uncle and was desperate to see him. This was on 4th of July weekend. So 4th of July is Independence Day. Almost all American workers get the whole weekend off for a long weekend and a vacation. And he was all set. He was ticketed. And on the way to, I'm on the way to the airport with the family. And he phones me. <laughs> And he says, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I, I have to cancel on everyone. We say, why? Because <laughs> Bezos demanded that all the executives show up for a meeting on the 4th of July. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the I mean he, would, he would make everybody show up on Christmas. <laughs> no, like it's your... such a work ethic, it's incredible. And, and your previous book is, is is private government, the tyranny of corporations or the tyranny of, of bosses. So that I mean that that's pretty close to tyranny, all right. Um, oh, it's yeah, totally. But um, one of the one of the things I mean, it's the Puritans and the Protestants uh, they, they they figure very largely in, in in your work. Some people have suggested there's like you know, and and the monks are often criticised by them, and yet the, the the monasteries are centres of sort of industry and work in themselves. So do you think that? that's an exaggerated polemic against the existing and, and really true? Or do you think that there's a real difference in the Protestant work ethic versus the monkish work ethic? Because like famously Weber says, the monks now have to walk out, a, 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 a we've turned the whole world into a monastery or something like that. I think it's, it's directly, he's quoting Baxter or something like that. Yeah, so, so <clears throat> right. So that's really interesting. The biggest difference is um, that the monks, notion of holy work is ritualistic it's about prayer <laughs> and you know singing chants <laughs> and uh you know sacraments the performance of sacraments right so that that good works all have to do with sacraments within the catholic tradition whereas for puritans no they're really consequentialists and hard-headed what are the consequences in the world mm -hmm. <laughs> for doing this stuff? And so that, that's why they thought that the monks were useless. They might be busy, but they're not actually helping people in the world. Yeah. Okay. And that's really critical. I, I, it's almost impossible to exaggerate how hard headed empiricist <laughs> the Puritans were, even though they, of course, you know, they have this theological thing, so they're not totally empiricist. Um, and it famously, notoriously in the United States, you know, they went on witch hunts, mm. right, in Salem, Massachusetts. But they actually felt guilty after doing that <laughs> because they realized, uh oh, we let this get out of hand. <laughs> but um, 
the Puritans, you know, what are you supposed to do on Sunday? Well, yeah, you do have to go to services. But after that, what do you do? They suggested that you perform scientific experiments as a hobby. <laughs> Learn about the world. It's very concrete and material. So that's us, basically. We're, uh, we're, we're, we are these people. If we have any time off from, from teaching, we'll do scientific experiments. Yeah. <laughs> today. yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's a fascinating historical uh, sort of sort of work. And um, I kind of want to just return you to the present because you, you I mean, what, what I think is really important about this, uh, this, this is that you have different work ethics and the different possibilities for different combinations and that maybe the progressive work ethic might might have a comeback or something like that. Now that we're in this this totally liminal crisis point of COVID and the pandemic and the ecological problems, do you see that there's any sort of, do you have any sort of hopes for the resurgence of the a progressive work ethic? Part of our, part of our, 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 our theme is, is what kind of hopes are there for the future in this darkest of times? Yeah, well, I do, I do have some hope for a, a renewal of the, the progressive work ethic. And let me tell you a little bit about the um, context in, in the American context. I mean, as you know, we are in a crisis of democracy. Hmm because the Republican Party really doesn't believe in it anymore. <laughs> mm. However, from an economic point of view, <clears throat> it's quite surprising how far left consensus views are. Not, and of course, remember, everything in America, politically speaking, is well to the right of everything in Europe, practically. <laughs> but I mean, so relative to our spec political spectrum, whenever, increases in the minimum wage are put to a referendum, including in the deepest red states, they win. Mm. That is underlying popular opinion. You could talk to, to most Republicans and they think, yes, of course we should increase the minimum wage. It's outrageous that people could be toiling away at two jobs and still mm. be impoverished, which is the case in the United States because our minimum wage is scandalously low. There's a lot of other economic proposals like this that the plutocrats in the United States don't want to see happen, but in fact are broadly popular. Biden's $1.9 trillion economic plan for dealing with the pandemic is wildly popular, even among the Republican rank and file. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> right. Uh, it's great because it's, it's, not just, it's not just a criticism of everything that there is, because there's so much about critique in, in, in the academy or in politics, we criticize things, but what you're suggesting, and rather than criticizing the single work ethic, we're mobilizing the ideal, the better norm of the progressive work ethic, something we can all get behind. Yes, exactly. And that's, that's what I want to say, especially in the work ethic saturated the United States to recover this positive tradition. And the truth is, is that neoliberalism has a lot to answer for, and Americans are pretty upset by a lot of stuff. So you might have heard about how the big pharmaceutical companies in the United States engaged in terrible marketing, mm -hmm. fraudulent, literally fraudulent marketing of opioid painkillers on a massive scale and created a huge problem. I mean, a, a scandalously vast problem of addiction which is, by the way, concentrated among white people, <laughs> okay? So one thing to understand about the United States is that you can never exaggerate how much racism affects domestic policy in the United States. It's a fundamental cause for why the United States is well to the right of any place in Europe. It's really the legacies of slavery, Jim Crow. It's racism that's driving that. But now that whites are being screwed, <laughs> <laughs> right, they are the principal people to whom all of these opioid uh, pills were being prescribed. It, and, you know, they're dying. They're literally dying en masse from this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and so the critique of capitalism has moved well beyond, you know, lefty circles and, and mm -hmm. has spread across the population. And basically what the Republican Party is doing right now is they're trying to distract people with culture war stuff. 
you know, so you might have heard they're like talking all the time about the cancellation of Dr. Seuss. <laughs> yeah. right? like, most people are worried, right, that their spouse is an addict. Okay, not most people, you know, but a lot of people, they're worried about stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so that's where we are. But I do think the country is ripe for a revival of a progressive uh, uh, work ethic. Hmm. And astounding that that, 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 that that could be a hopeful time, thing in these times. But as you described the work ethic, it, it genuinely is. So I'm going to, I'm going to, step to one side to open up the uh the but thank you so much for talking to me it's and, a pleasure uh, yeah for sending sending all these things on and reading more and we'll, we'll talk uh, more later but i'd like to just invite people to uh spot into the chat and we'll we'll um we'll see if we can uh uh give them the mic if that's possible um and um I see Jordan Kerwin's hand up. Jordan, I, I, I don't know, can you can, can, can he speak or not? Or? Yeah, no, I uh, put myself back on it. Um, yeah, I'm good to go. And I realised the irony of um, asking this question when there is a crucifix bolted to the, um, to the wall behind me. Um, I haven't talked about puritanism and, and everything else with it. Um, <laughs> I, I had a conversation just with a friend um, the other week. I know you're kind of talking about, I suppose, being kind of hopeful about kind of nearly this kind of reimagining of, of a work ethic. But is, is there a risk the way the world is at the moment that we're nearly too far over the edge that it's it's almost kind of like this, this hyper neoliberal society at the moment that is there ever really an opportunity to kind of work back to, to an alternative or, or to have an alternative present in society the way between neoliberalism and, and capitalism is at the moment. Oh yeah. So <clears throat> I mean the, the the conclusion, the concluding chapter is really a, a, of this book is a critique of neoliberalism and then a, attempt to re-envision what a truly progressive work ethic would look like. And it, it's it it's calling basically for an updating of social democracy. And an important thing, which I, I didn't include, but Max Weber correctly argued that over time, the work ethic got secularized. But what does secularization mean? It means pulling goods that are promised in the next life into this life. And what was the principal good that Richard Baxter promised people who obeyed the work ethic, well, when you're saved, you enjoy the saints' everlasting rest, <laughs> right? You work like the Dickens in this life, right? But then you get like an eternal vacation, you know, communing with God in the next. And as the work ethic secularized on the progressive side, what this meant is that leisure is good. And one of the principal achievements of social democracy in Europe is guaranteed paid vacations, right? As an end in itself, not just to recharge yourself to work again, right? And yeah. that's that's like a classic example of secularization. In America, you know, workers, there's no guaranteed paid vacations. We're the only rich country in the world that doesn't have that. And, and so you can get it by contract with your employer, but only about half of American workers even get paid vacations through the private employment contract. And if you look at how Americans work, <clears throat> a majority of American workers don't even take all the vacation they're entitled to. <laughs> right? uh, yeah. Because we're like, right, the work ethic. <laughs> you have to be forced to take an extra day. Uh, you have holidays built up, please take them. Uh, so we don't have to take them away from you, uh, kind of <laughs> situation. Um, but it's interesting, there was, there was another kind of half question um, that I had kind of coming into this is, I think before the pandemic, I think there was this kind of um, kind of building conversation that, um, you know, certain countries were were trying to implement kind of this uh, kind of a four day working week, and to kind of promote more leisure and, and family time and so on and so on, and I think it's really interesting to see what 
like certain jobs and certain businesses that all of us like always would have said right we need people on site and they need to be here and present are now starting to realize that a lot of the things that people could be doing can be done from home in, in their kitchens or, or front offices or, or whatever it may be um so i think that's really interesting to see now in, in terms of where our work ethic may end up is that i think a lot of people are kind of surprised about what they can achieve um from their from their spare rooms and, and, and so on uh, it's just really interesting to see what that'll do for certain reforms over time as well yeah i agree i i think it raises interesting possibilities although a lot of people i mean it's complicated because with the pandemic here, women in particular have a really tough job if the kids are home from school due to the pandemic mm. <laughs> or their preschool kids. And, and it's actually been catastrophic for women's employment because many of them have had to quit their jobs to take care of the kids because they can't do both. Mm. Um, and, and the office does serve functions, a lot of social functions actually. So there's this experiment done by one firm in the United States giving people the option, well, you could stay home or go to the office. And they found that the people who stayed home and worked from home were more productive. But if you, but then they got so Your sanity crazy. <laughs> they got, you know, <laughs> that they wanted the sociability of the office. <laughs> they wanted yeah, to get back yeah, in. Yeah. I think maybe a hybrid model would be good, though. It'd be good to be able to cut back on commuting. It pollutes, yeah. you know. Yeah, definitely the climate. Potential. I knew I... And I, um, People do need face-to-face -face engagement. I miss my students in the classroom. Yeah. yeah. Can I just cut in? Some people are having difficulty, I think, raising their hands. I think there's a raise hands device. And then we have, we have a, a, good, a good number of questions. So I want to go to Tara, then Rebecca, then Bjorn, then Balahar, then Jody. And any more questions are, are, are very, very much appreciated. But if you can't raise your hand or just, just speak up. I think to Tara next, we're going. Thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, hi, Elizabeth. I just want to say I'm a huge fan. <laughs> I'm very excited to meet you. And um, uh, I was wondering, I mean, I, you kind of touched on this a bit, but, you know, it's, it, if, if the um, policies of Republicans are so unpopular or they're so against the popular policies, um, in the United States, then I'm wondering, you know, pre-Trump, I know, I know that the base is, is like Trump is kind of keeping the base going, but before Trump, how did they have a base? How were there still people? I just don't understand the, the logic of people voting against, you know, their welfare. And I'm wondering if it has something to do with, I mean, and, and also the fact that so many of them are very religious. Oh, that's a huge part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So 25% <clears throat> of the American population is Christian evangelical. Hmm. So uh, the, the critical thing to understand about politics is you should think of it about two axes, right? One would be socio-political issues. And there, like the center of the country is well to the left of where it actually exists in policy terms. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the yeah. vertical axis is sort of the cultural stuff, right? Abortion, LGBT, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Feminism, uh, culture war stuff. And evangelicals hate all the left on all the cultural issues. And that they feel demeaned and threatened by all these different people. Uh, and, and so basically the path to victory for the Republican Party, and this has been true for decades, ha has been to stress the vertical axis of cu cultural conflict in order to win votes. That makes sense. And also, of course, racism. Again, you can never exaggerate how much racism is structured in contemporary American politics and if you see the whole history of America. Racial fear is just huge. So Black Lives Matter in the United States was highly polarizing, right? The left support and the right thinks what? They want to defund the police and then they're going to allow like black criminals to overrun us. I mean, that's really how they're thinking. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Um, 
can I can I ask is Rebecca are you able to use your um, mic or I can read out the question shoot yeah um thanks so much for the discussion so far I was just wondering sort of about works in the political economy realm and how that features in your sort of book in your writing as well and the discussion about welfare obviously not obviously but made me specifically think about works like uh, Varieties of Capitalism, so Hall and Suskage, and um, the welfare literature around sort of Esping Anderson. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> That's quite right. Indeed, I have a chapter discussing that. <laughs> yeah, so, right, I do think that, you know, the Varieties of Capitalism literature is uncovering how different versions of the work ethic have developed. So in the selection I gave you, I talk about the commodification of labor, which is absolutely central. And, and, you know, on the one hand, you know, so Esping Anderson, for instance, focuses on decommodification as core to social democracy. But there's two different kinds of commodification. So one, which Esping Anderson stresses, is the idea that your life prospects should not hang fundamentally on your work that you get a rich bunch of social benefits like healthcare, for instance, without paying out of pocket or relying on work in order to get access to them. But there's also a narrow sense of commodity where a commodity in economics is something like wheat, where one bushel of wheat is exactly the same as the other, <laughs> right? They're completely interchangeable. And, and commodification in the narrow sense is really core to the business strategy that we saw in the Industrial Revolution, where you narrow down work into this task that could be endlessly repeated and anybody could be put in, slotted into that position and doing it the identical labor. And you see that that business model, which basically at its heart, if you reduce something to a commodity, in economics, we know what happens. You have many competitors and profits are driven to zero, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's only when you have some kind of monopoly going on, like unique talents that are very rare, that you get really good wages. And so you see it's fundamental to the business model of capitalist businesses to try to commodify labor in this narrow sense. And that's what I'm criticizing in my selection. What do you need professionals for? <laughs> <laughs> right? No, you try to like turn everything into an algorithm or a protocol, right? And then everybody, you could, then you could slot in anybody to do that job. You don't need highly trained professionals with expert knowledge and judgments, right? And, and, and you see that happening. It's, it's just, it's part of the fundamental business strategy because once you can drive wages lower by commodifying labor in that sense, uh, uh, then capitalists can reap more profits. Now, whether in fact you deliver as good services as before, I think is highly questionable, right? Um, but capitalists don't care about that, right? They just want to maximize profits. Thank you. Um, we have oh, Balahar, are you? And just beforehand, just to mention, since it's this interesting uh, connection to religion, next week we'll actually be returning twice to the question of religion and markets uh, with Stefan Sportskopf at 10 o'clock and with uh, governmentality and, and, and with De uh, Mitchell Dean on Thursday at 10 o'clock. So more to come of this, but to Balahar now. Uh, cheers, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, I, I really enjoyed uh, the, the reading, reading the paper. My, my question is about the unearned income or the earned rentier income. Um, uh, what I found interesting was that uh, Bentham seemed to be critical or condemning of the poor unearned income, right? But he seemed to let the, the landlords and the very rich off the hook. Uh, but of course, at the same time, uh, you know, you did have Adam Smith condemning unearned income. You know, he talked about uh, the landlords reap what they have not sown. So yeah. my question is, is, is how did Benson react to Adam Smith? That's, that's the first part. And my second, and my second part is, 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 is just a slight follow up. Of course, John Stuart Mill was critical of earned income. You know, he talked about landlords 
uh, making money in their sleep without justice or right, without, exactly. without economizing or risking. So yeah. how do you how do you then have you know a fellow utilitarian, uh, you know, coming up with a totally different well, well not totally but but you know condemning what uh, or picking up what Benson failed to pick up. Oh yes, so you see, this is a that's such a wonderful observation you make about Mill because I have a chapter on Mill in which I argue that he's just he's got a pure Lockean theory of property. Property, right, is based on labor. <laughs> it's the people who work the land who are entitled to it, and, and I, I'm sure you're aware that that was the basis for his plan for uh, land tenure reform in Ireland to 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 see to it that the peasants, the Irish peasants would get the land because they're the ones who are working it. And he held that very consistently through his whole career. And, and <clears throat> I think what we see is, and this is actually an important thing to keep in mind is that liberalism as a construct actually contains both the conservative and the progressive work ethics. And, and Bentham and also Priestley are on the conservative side, okay? And then people like John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith, much more on the progressive side. Now, of course, because the work ethic at its origins contains contradictions, you do always see some contradictions. So Bentham did spar with aristocrats but he never really took, the, took that seriously from a distributive justice point of view the way that John Stuart Mill did. Cheers, thank you. Um, can I turn to Jody now? I have in my stack. Jody, are you? Yeah, hi, I'm here. Um, thank you so much such fascinating talk um I uh just my question is I'm, I'm interested in the sort of Puritan roots and the sort of relig religious roots and um you talked about the fact that there may be a renewal of this um positive work ethic in America and I'm just thinking about the Puritans and how they would have obviously had a, a faith a belief you know in God and that would have they would have seen themselves within the kingdom of God you know working sort of in the world but not of the world and how then can, can this positive work ethic be incorporated in, in the secular world? I mean, obviously it hasn't, it hasn't so far worked very well, as you said, it's split off into kind of two directions, but if we see a renewal without the kind of motivating factor of faith in God in, in the Puritans, like how, how can we see that renewal, you know, of the positive work ethic? Right, well, <clears throat> so, over time, the work ethic got secularized. And, um, and both sides, both the conservatives and the progressives, developed the work ethic in, in, in very secular ways. So let me just tell you about my favorite example of this, which is in Marx. Um, you know, social democracy came out of Marxism. And if you read the very first work that Marx ever wrote, which was his final examination, his graduation exam uh, from high school, uh, it was an assigned uh, topic that he had to write an essay on, on a young man's choice of uh, vocation. And what he wrote was almost an exact reproduction of Sanderson's criteria for how you do this, thrown in with the German Enlightenment ideal of Bildung, the idea that you should develop multi-sided talents um, in your calling, and that you should, in working for the benefit of others, receive recognition for that work from the recipients of your services or your labor. And, you know, Already there in high school, you have almost complete his ideal of unalienated labor. And then what, you, what my argument is, is that his critique of capitalism is basically that 
it does not, it, it's form, the labor form that it's created is unworthy of the kind of commitment uh, uh, that the work ethic demands of us. And what we should seek as, as a society that would organize work in such a way that it would actually inspire our enthusiasm and rightly so, right? Because it enhances our own talents and it's a source of recognition from others of the value we're contributing to society. And then, and then we would want to work, right? And so the progressive work ethic, instead of just telling workers nose to the grindstone and feel lucky that you're getting a few pennies per hour, the progressive work ethic instead says, how would work have to be organized in order to merit the commitment that the work ethic expects of us, okay? And then you see that both the content of labor, the recognition it gets, and the distributive rewards, right, have to go to every worker in such a way that they feel enhanced by the labor that they're doing. That's a pretty stringent criterion. Right, and it, it can it, that could be developed in very positive directions. Thank you. Um, we we're drifting towards the end. Maybe we'll go over. I I, I see the hand up of uh, I think Bjorn Thomason next, joining us from from Denmark. The great thing of these international conferences is we can see old friends. Bjorn. Indeed, and um, it's fantastic to see all of my Irish friends. There's an enormous echo on my computer right now. Um, we'll move that. But um, going to my question, thanks a lot, Elizabeth, for a fascinating talk. And I'm learning from your work. Um, my question is to Weber's kind of thesis and whether he was actually right. Um, and there's a huge discussion uh, around that. And um, economic historians tend to be much more skeptical about it than sociologists who kind of buy into what he said. And there are, I mean, there are two main dimensions, I guess, to the debate. Um, one is, is really historical and tracing back the work ethic uh, can be done at least to the Benedictines that had Ora et Labora as a motto. And this was certainly not just ceremonial work uh, it was land, uh, it was uh, development of technologies, irrigation systems, buildings, uh, medicine, uh, anything one can count as work they were engaged with. And, 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 and really, that is one big part of the discussion that Weber was exaggerating what really happened there and it can be taken further back. Uh, the other uh, dimension is, is more empirical. Uh, several economic historians have uh, tested Weber's hypothesis in German lands trying to see if there really was a difference in economic outcome and economic growth. And Germany is perfect for that because you've got after the Reformation, um, the different territorial units of Germany are neatly divided into conf along confessional lines. So you can, you can measure pretty easily. And there is consensus now among economic historians that the effect on whether it's a Protestant or, or Catholic area on economic performance is around 0.0. .0. <laughs> Yeah, right. it, it really, it really, it cannot be traced empirically, right? So I'm not saying everything from papers that was wrong, but but so how 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 do you position yourself in terms of those debates about what Weber said and the extent to which he he, he can? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Point. So I I I'm not particularly interested in trying to defend the view that adoption of the Pro Protestant ethic is responsible for the rise of capitalism, empirically or causally or anything like that, right? And, and so I, I, I'm not committed at all to the view that, you know, you could sort Protestant, you know, and Catholic areas, you know, and say the work ethic made the Protestant areas more advanced capitalism. Uh, and so I, I, I'm just interested in the work ethic itself as an ideology and how that informed things like welfare policy, um, the organization of work, um, 
and penal policies and, and things like that. And the ideology of outsourcing and profit maximization, like where are these, it's more at the level of ideology than it is at thinking about like overall differences in capitalist development. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm on mute back for the net. I, I'm beginning to realize that we didn't schedule enough time for all of this, right? I'm happy to go on if people if, if, want to. No, uh, I mean, so, so if anybody has other places to go, we won't take it against you. We won't mark it down against your name or something like this in some sort of penal uh, purgatorial logic. Uh, but if people are able to hang on, that that's fantastic, and we have we have several questions more to go, and this this discussion is going in so many different directions that are that are worth pursuing. I think we have um, Ray Griffin, Kieran Kirhan, and Anthony Behan next. Katrina Nihul, and then we have two questions in the side. So we'll go with Ray first. But if you have to leave, thank you so much for attending, people. So Ray. Thanks a million. Um, that was a really, really uh, smashing uh, conversation uh, between Tom and yourself. Um, I suppose I'm interested in your approach to secularization, and you you take up kind of a um, a Weberian approach to it. Um, that I know a lot of people in the group will be aware of Eric Vogelin's work on the distinctive way you take it, which is this idea of bringing. Um, that from the next life into this life, you know, so kind of immanitizing the eschaton in the kind of slogan version of Vogelin's spiel. But the the bit that I don't, I, I think you kind of play down or, or haven't explored necessarily is the way in secularization, we compartmentalize the economy from society, uh, from politics and from religion. And but then you have this very expressive kind of elaboration of the way the work ethic is almost like a contemporary religion, which suggests that secularization, uh, the secularization thesis has not really completed. It's, it's, it's kind of only partial. I just wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about your approach to the secularization thesis and then uh, probably beyond the scope of the time we have here, but maybe to mention the kind of transition that you point up in Adam Smith to Ricardo in economics as this kind of separation, which I think is quite an interesting part of your work. Ah, so, um, <clears throat> in the conservative work ethic, um, as advanced by people like Burke, God's laws are the laws of the market. And free market, like unregulated market. And what he meant by unregulated market, Burke opposed um, any attempts by law to say minimum wage laws or any kind of labor regulation that would help the workers, right? And he said it's a violation of God's law. And you can see that in, in Malthus as well. Right, so that's, you know, Malthus hated the poor laws, <laughs> right? It's keeping workers afloat, then the population explosion. But really, I actually think that almost all of Malthus can be read independently of the population explosion. What's really driving him is the sense that the poor laws enable poor people to be idle. And, you know, and that was corrupt, morally corrupting. And that is still something you hear today, in, in, you know, in critiques of the welfare state, right? It's rewarding idleness <laughs> and profligacy and so forth. So those ideas are, are still there. Now I, on the, the progressive work ethics side, there's much more of a sense that markets are socially constructed, right? They're products of law, they're pieces of social engineering, only, you know, under neoliberalism, they, or, capitalism and the earlier formation, right? They were rigged in favor of the rich. Well, we can rig them differently, <laughs> right? To help everybody and not just the people at the top. But, but that, that reflects a 
clearer understanding of reality, which is that marks, markets are a product of law. Now, now, Smith did have this notion of natural liberty or the system of natural liberty, but I, but I just want to stress that the reason why Smith spoke in that way wasn't because he thought that that the system of natural liberty was like God's law, um, but rather that he recognized that at the time all the regulation that existed was in favor of the rich. All the state regulation, right? The monopolies, <laughs> right? In those days, they had maximum wage laws. <laughs> and, and it's very important if you actually read through the Hall Smith corpus. Um, the, he never once condemns the poor laws except in one respect, and that's the law of settlement, which forced poor people to return to their place of birth in order to get assistance. And his critique is, well, that's an impairment of labor mobility. A lot of these places where people were born no longer have jobs, they're, they're economically declining. Why not give them the liberty to go to the cities and find their fortunes without running the risk of, you know, if they, if they can't find work, they're destitute. And then they have to go to some place where they have no prospects back, back in their place of birth. That was very unjust to the workers. They need mobility in order to find opportunities for a better life. Virtually everything Smith said was in sympathy for the workers. And he thought, you know, the capitalist manufacturers, a bunch of schemers who are plotting against the public interest. And, and the landlords are these lazy people who can't be bothered to, you know, tend their farms, <laughs> right? You should, give the, you should give the land to the people who are really going to pay close attention to the small details that are needed to run a, 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 run a really productive farm. It's, it's, it's a re um... I sometimes feel that the, the, the technology doesn't allow us to have a, a really great discussion. It's a QA and a kind of uh, machine, this, right? So in a way, we could keep going with all these discussions. And yet, moving on to Kieran with a question. Thanks again, Elizabeth. For, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting. I just want to take up one, one, one theme uh, within this, which is... Uh, you know, uh, an essential aspect of the of the work ethic originally in Weber's formulation is, you know, that people throw themselves into their work to avoid the terror of damnation, of, of not being amongst the elect, and so on and so forth. You know, so you have this, uh, um, uh, and that that libidinal economy. How does it play out presently? And in other words, one of the things that's happened there is, you know, that the the religious. Uh, uh, vehicle of that has has fallen away. So people throw themselves into their work. Uh, now, not so much out of fear of damnation in that kind of traditional sense, but fear of meaninglessness, fear of the void, as it were, you know, that everything is just opens up, you know, and, uh, opioid addiction is a, a very interesting symptom of that, uh, and so on. But I, I'm, I'm interested, I, I guess, in the ways in which uh, it's that is really one of the keys to Trump and Trumpism and QAnon and all of that, you know, in other words, that uh, in the, uh, with no work to throw yourself into, you know, all of that uh, disappearance of the, the uh, jobs of uh, blue collar America and so on and so forth, they need something uh, to fill that void, you know, to, to kind of take the place of uh, meaninglessness and so on. And that's uh, typically, as Weber predicted, you know, the the, uh, uh, the the demagogue, you know, the charismatic authority who promises, as it were, to fill out the the, the void. I, I'm just wondering what you think of that kind of uh, uh, hypothesis. To that, so you know, as I pointed out, even my own students who are overwhelmingly upper middle class, they feel a vague sense of guilt when they're not working for a wage. It's very strange, but. But for the, for the working class, especially the white working class in the United States, they really have objectively experienced declining prospects. Mm -hmm. You can measure this in declining life expectancy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the economists, uh, um, Ann Case and Angus Deaton talk about deaths of despair and you can measure it. Like why does the white working class have a lower life expectancy? Mm -hmm. It's 
overdoses, alcoholism, suicide. I mean, it's like these awful things. And if you look at where the, the shift, you, there's very fine grained studies that have been done. If you look at the shift from voting for Obama in 2012 to voting for Trump in 2016, Okay, like that's a very small number of voters, but they swung very radically in precisely those areas that suffered deindustrialization as a result of international trade, with the factories then moving to China and Mexico. And Trump's message was, you know, a foreign enemy, right? I'm gonna cut better deals. Mm. It resonated. And, and you know, you talk to a lot of these Trump voters and the men especially feel at a loss. Like what are they doing with their lives? And, and so, some people have done deep dives in, in, into this. And like now they're, you know, they got divorced when they lost their job. And now they're on their third or fourth girlfriend. They haven't seen their kids in years. They're like totally alienated. And here's the greatest irony of all when it comes to this. Is that back around <clears throat> maybe 1980 something, William Julius Wilson, one of the leading sociologists of his day, wrote a book about uh, uh, conditions in uh, racially segregated black ghettos. And it's called The Truly Disadvantaged, it's a sociological classic in America, in which he argued that what happened to black people was they basically got hit by deindustrialization first and they couldn't leave because the way housing works in the United States, they're stuck in the inner city where manufacturing left, but there's so much housing discrimination that blacks couldn't move to the suburbs where all the new jobs were popping up. And, and Wilson, you know, is doing these studies and one of his claims is that work organizes life. This is primarily for men, by the way. I think it's less prominent for women because women can always raise the kids, right? <laughs> right? They always have work. <laughs> women never don't have work, at least if they're, you know, if they have children. But it was really demoralizing for the men, you know, for black men in particular who felt detached and, and thrown away by society. Because they didn't, you know, you wake up and what do you have to do? Well, there's nothing really to do. Mm -hmm. Especially if they're not married to the mother of their children. It's very alienated. And now the same thing is hitting whites. And it's so ironic that this is happening. Because whites for the longest time said, well, it's just because blacks don't have the work ethic. Right. And now they themselves are without jobs and being demoralized in the same way with family breakdown and drug addiction and all these kinds of things. Right. So they're suffering from the same economic forces that Blacks suffered from decades earlier. It's just caught up to them. Right. I just draw it, just in case you guys are not watching the chat, just on the side in the chat, there's a few questions that are really strongly connected to this because um, it mentioned that this thing of the despair and, and the meaninglessness, but also the importance of, 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 of gender here. Um, can, Katrina Nihul's question is spot on that, just oh, as you're discussing oh. this now. Um, Katrina, are you still there and able to use your mic? It'd be terrible if I had to read out the question, right? Because there'd be sort of an irony in that. Yeah. Said she has to leave. <laughs> Did she have to leave? Oh God, she or Elizabeth Creed similarly, but you know, along the lines of Kathy Reed's book, The Problem with Work, The Feminist Critique of Work, um, you raised the question of how would work have to be organized in order to merit the commitment the work ethic demands? But how does this question relate to the feminist analysis of capitalism's reliance on unpaid labor, care, domestic and reproductive, which we were discussing just before we came on, how can this kind of work access the recognition, rewards, or potential for personal enhancement associated with the progressive work ethic? So oh, absolutely. That's yeah. such a fantastic question. And, and, you know, if you go back to the Puritans, domestic dependent care labor was unquestionably work that's fully fulfilled the demands of the work ethic. Of course it's work. Child rearing is hard work and socially necessary. 
obviously. And, and, you know, under capitalism, of course, capitalism wasn't really interested in accommodating that because they couldn't make profits off of it, <laughs> right? But this is what's so stunning. So you might have heard that Senator Romney, of all people, has, promote, has proposed for the first time, for a senator at least, a uh, universal uh, child care allowance. $300 a month, and you would just get it automatically for as long as your kids are, you know, minors, okay? It's unbelievable that he would come up with this because number one, he's a Republican, okay? And Republicans never <laughs> have ever cared about this, right? <clears throat> because they always had the model of the male breadwinner and the dependent wife taking care of the kids unpaid because she'd get her income from her husband. That's always been the model in the Republican Party. So for Romney to come out with this stunningly progressive proposal, which by the way, if implemented, would lift literally millions of children out of poverty. It, it's just mind blowing, especially since when he ran and was defeated, uh, when he ran for president and Obama defeated him, he was caught on tape uh, with a, se a secret taping of a private meeting with fund rate with donors for his presidential campaign in which he was railing about the Democrats already have 47% of the vote. These are the people who won't take responsibility for themselves and just want a handout from government. <laughs> right. <clears throat> and now he's like completely turned it's, it's, I cannot exaggerate how shocking and stunning this is, but also the $300 a month is wildly popular. It, it would, people would love it because it's very hard to be a parent in America and have to be working the crazy hours that their jobs demand. And $300 a month would just be huge. Whole drift to rethinking work to be, to be had in all of this and, under COVID, we have this nice support for just the work of the work of keeping safe. So it's it's you know real rethink to be had. Anthony, I just want to bring in for our last. Is it possibly our last question? But Anthony Behan, you've had your hand up for some time. Yeah. Patiently. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks and uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Great talk. Wonderful to hear you. Um, some of the things that Ray and and Kieran already mentioned kind of relate to this. But I, I, I uh, my question is about the. The, the Protestant piece of the, of, the, of the work ethic and sort of the religious and the theological um, elements to it, um, in particularly during COVID and comments by US politicians, particularly in Texas, if memory serves, that, you know, particularly the older politicians, look, I should probably die in order that the young people be fine. And this sort of tendency towards a death cult um, that, you know, we have, um, a lot of talk about um, the religious element and you know and 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 the sort of the, the evangelical Christian leadership and things like that. But but how genuine is that? And did we actually see the mask slipping somewhat during COVID, where you know what Ray referred to, you know the the Vogel and thing, the, the humanitizing, the, the the eschaton. You know that in truth there is no transcendental vision here. This is just pure capital that's driving this thing. I mean, th this, this idea of a death cult, is that something that um, has some credibility? I mean, it's not very overt, but is it something that, that is, 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 it just seems like such a destructive thing? Um, <laughs> Look, I agree with you, it's completely destructive. You know, but I, I, I wouldn't call it a death cult. It, it's <clears throat> by far the best theory that explains what's going on is a theory known as cultural cognition that's developed by uh, Dan Kahan. If you just Google cultural cognition, you'll get this whole website with millions of papers. It's about basically how different groups of people process informa scientific information about the risks of different activities, okay? And basically the argument is that people process risk information through their social identities, okay? And so they'll just, if, if, if some 
if something like mask wearing is framed as a threat to their identity, they're just going to scoff at it. <laughs> Okay, and, and think this is ridiculous, it's offensive, it's violating my liberty and stuff like this, right? But if it's framed in a way that's consistent with their identity, then they'll be totally on board. So the basic idea is that people process scientific information about risks, filtering it through the way the risk is framed as either a threat to their social identity or as in conformity with it and affirming it. And so I firmly believe that had Donald Trump, instead of tearing off his mask in defiance, if he had told all of his supporters, look, we're all good patriots here and it's your duty to wear a MAGA mask. And then he ran a side gig selling millions of masks with MAGA on it. Every single Republican would be wearing a mask. <laughs> Right? Because then he would have said, then he would have affirmed their identity, so this is a good thing, and they would have done it. But isn't, okay. it isn't it more about the, the, the opening of the economy? Rather, I know the mask thing was one part of it, but the opening of the economy was really the big thing. Look, if we don't have the economy, we don't have a life, and therefore the only thing we believe in is the economy, and therefore you have this sort of nihilist thing. You, you use the phrase, uh, uh, the work ethic itself as ideology. And it's sort of this- Yeah, yeah. Although, you thing. know, <clears throat> it, even when Republicans were in control, they passed trillions of dollars of support for businesses and workers. And you could keep that going for quite a long time. I, I, the, the main thing was that it was administratively flawed. So that small businesses yeah. had hard times getting access to the money. Had it been better designed, as far as the objective economics goes, there's no reason why government spending couldn't have kept afloat a lot of the small businesses as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So are we um, running? Sorry, am I on mute still? No, I'm okay. Um, I think that um, maybe our work ethic is, is exhausted now, perhaps, <laughs> by these discussions, invigorating and all as they are. Um, uh, you know, time and a half should be paid for this kind of thing, although probably we'll only end up sending you a piece of Waterford Crystal, which is <laughs> our post-industrial, uh, post-modern chic of, 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 of a place that used to make things, but now is a tourist attraction. Nobody can come. Listen, I just want to uh, thank Elizabeth for, for such a stimulating, uh, a stimulating uh, discussion and uh, everybody who attended and asked questions. Thank you all very much. Uh, next Tuesday and Thursday at 10 o'clock each day, GMT. Um, we'll have uh, Stefan Schwarzkopf and Mitchell Dean. You can check out our website for that. This will be recorded and eventually end up on the web someplace or other. And um, I think that's all, folks. And so thank you very much, Elizabeth. And thank you. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you and really, really fabulous questions. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.